I went to MIT where Minor White gave me a camera. His new Department of Photography at MIT, new documentary film program at MIT run by Ricky Leacock. This was all happening in 1968. The Living Theater came and camped out on campus. There was a sit-in of an AWOL soldier in the campus. And in the midst of this, the MIT photo armory program that Minor White had come to start handed out cameras. And I go back to this moment because I was invited to leave the classroom, a large and bulky camera, tripod, and black cloth, and go walking around the streets of Boston, needing to turn in three finished prints within 24 hours. And given no more instruction than that, except maybe how to load the camera. And I got under this black cloth and saw on the ground glass of a large format camera, so not the small ones that we use, but a large one. The world walking around upside down on this glowing screen. And I realized that I could take that frame and I could make it permanent and it could travel through time into the future so that I could witness something in the present and think about it in the future. And that did it for me. It was always something I was interested in. The things that you have done have become important was a phrase I used to mull over even as a little girl. But here was its physical form. And I learned how to do it technically. And over the course of that year, I made a series of photographs of men in the suburbs. I didn't realize until years later that the men in the suburbs of Boston really were my father and that generation that fought in World War II. And he was away for years in Hawaii, the Philippines, and in the occupying forces in Japan. I didn't realize that I was looking to understand how that experience drove them on a temporary pass from war into the suburbs as a kind of prayer for the next generation, which was me. The exhibit, The Tenderness of Men in Suburbs, Mark Bauer, he did the most extraordinary thing, turning the Whitney Humanity Center into an art exhibition space for Yale faculty and other people. As I was contemplating the other wars that the United States has been involved with and the other father and daughters who were trying to negotiate what that meant. Photography allows us to capture a moment and then look back. It's like Wordsworth's definition of poetry, what he distilled from his own experience with the French Revolution, which he abhorred. So photography was always history for me. But the reason I could participate in this here at Yale was because it's called humanities, public humanities and not public history, because this is not a kind of history that historians have understood. So that's the genesis of it, is the sense of history and what a photograph and an engagement with a much wider scene of the event of photography, that's Ariella Azale's term, allows us to understand at the time and in the future of a witness to history. Phonogrammer came about because of two brilliant graduate students, Lauren Tilton and Taylor Arnold, who came to me after a seminar. Lauren, she knew about my work in photography, but she also knew about public humanities. And it was those two things that drew Lauren here. And she was in a graduate seminar on history, photography, and memory that I taught. And they had an assignment on the FSAOWI photographs, the Farm Security Administration photographs of the Great Depression and the way they melted into Office of War information in the beginning of World War II. And she was very frustrated with the search engine that the Library of Congress had been able to produce. And she came to me and she asked permission to do a project about that, grew the project into a grant application to the very first iteration of digital humanities grants from the NEH. We sent it in. We got that grant for $49,999. The uh, national government supported six people for six years on the Photogrammer Project. Obviously, many other people put in support. And it's another moment of upheaval and photography and history and government, that is the public. It was a remaking. It was a reconstruction of the idea of the public. It's another reconstruction in between 1865 and the 1965 Civil Rights Movement, the way I understand it. And it's a reconstruction. I'm talking about the New Deal. It's a reconstruction that dimmed over the surface of the key American social problem, which is race. And this is all very interesting again to me. Again, it's in, my interest is very imbued with the question of war. I've always been interested in how deeply 
the photographs of the Depression were preparing the country for an unannounced war, the war my father fought in and the war that we're still struggling with the debris of. So led by my students now, Lauren and Taylor, we digitized the over 170,000 photographs from the FSAOWI on an interactive, geospatially located digital map. And we used the resources that the incredible Library of Congress had managed to shepherd and keep, resources that Roy Stryker, who led this unit, was afraid were going to be discarded. He actually took physically boxes of the FSA materials and brought them to safe spaces. So we have them. So we relinked the map and the photographs and the metadata, and we made it public, and it's been an extraordinary project. And then finally, collaboration, a potential history of photography, which has been shown in Providence, it had been shown at the Aperture Gallery in New York City, it was shown in the Ryerson Image Center in Toronto, it was shown in the Sloat Foundation in Philly, and public art space in New Haven, very important to me that it's a public art space. What this actually is is the fruit of decades of work in photography by two extraordinary photographers, MacArthur Award-winning photographers, early women members of Magnum, Susan Micellis, who she transformed war photography in Nicaragua, and Wendy Ewald, who for decades has been going around the world working with children in schools and refugee camps and neighborhoods to help them manifest their dreams and perceptions of the history that they've encountered and the wars that they've survived. These two people, Ariela Azale, a Palestinian Israeli who has left Israel and come to be professor at Brown and has written memorably about photography as a social contract, has taught us to understand the broader scope of that event as a present event and a potential history, a history that can be remade in the future. So you can see where my understanding of the photograph as a history present and a history future comes into play. And Lee Rayford, brilliant professor at Berkeley, working with photographs of civil rights and freedom for decades. If you piled us together, we would have I don't even want to count the years of working with photographs. And we've come together to announce in this project that we need to remake the history of photography so that it sees it as a history of these events, as collaborative events, not as a history of great visionary, usually male thinkers who are the ones celebrated. And this history celebrates the achievements of these men and people. They are certainly achievements. But that kind of history leaves out everybody else and everything else that made it possible. The subject of the photograph, the archive, the neighborhoods, the communities, the collaborations that are always there. And we don't mean collaboration in a very simple way either. When I first hear the word, I think of the Vichy government. I think of collaboration as a frightening thing. And I think of collaboration as something forced, appropriation. And we have wanted to address the entire spectrum of collaboration in this project and exhibit. And we actually want to remake the idea of how we teach and learn and think about what the history of photography is.